During the uh, lecture in the last period, uh, Tom DiLorenzo told us 10 things that are wrong with socialism. Uh, I'm expecting that at the end of my talk, you'll be able to give 10 things that are wrong with my lecture. Uh, <laughs> that, that much easier to come up with more than that, but we don't want to make it too demanding. Now, I'm going to be talking about Mises and Rothbard on ethics. Uh, ethics is a very important subject. There's some people who don't care for ethics at all. One recalls in uh, one of the novels of the great British humorist P.G. Woodhouse, uh, uh, a character says to Jeeves, whenever anything comes up, I always ask myself one question, what's in it for me? Uh, I think if you hold that view, you probably won't find this lecture of all that much interest. Uh, now, if you, we look at the Mises, Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, we find that they have very similar views about policy, especially economic policy. Uh, both Mises and Rothbard support the free market, oppose socialism and government intervention in the economy. Now, there are differences about property rights. I'll get into that later. The main difference between Mises and Rothbard, aside, of course, from the anarchism, minarchism issue, concerns foundations of ethics. Rothbard, in in uh, contrast to Mises, thought that ethics is objective. If we say, for example, that people, we ought to promote the free market, this tells us what we ought morally to do. It isn't only that we're, this isn't only a claim about how we can realize the preferences for peace and prosperity that people, in fact, have. Mises said, well, everybody or practically everybody wants peace and prosperity. Uh, those who don't will tend to die out, so we'll have left those who want peace and prosperity. And if we want that, then we should institute the free market. So this is a claim about, it's a hypothetical claim. It's if we want this, we should have the free market. And in fact, we do want this, so then we should have the free market. You have if A, then B, but A, therefore B. It's hypothetical. So it doesn't say that we ought to value peace and prosperity. It's just that we do value peace and prosperity. So uh, many people along similar lines argue in this way. They say, well, uh, we could imagine, uh, Henry Hazlitt is one who argues this way, who says, uh, we could, the ideal state of affairs for everybody might be one where everybody could do whatever he wanted. You could just, any, anything you like would be all right, but we realize if everybody had that preference, we wouldn't be able to get what we, much of what we wanted would just be fighting and being in, co be in conflict with each other. So it's to our advantage to establish certain social institutions and limit our, uh, our trying to get what uh, we want. So we restrict each other. So morality on this view is a device or an institution. It's not that we get together and decide on this, but it's as if we had decided on this. We can use this as an explanatory hypothesis 
to explain morality. Morality is a system of uh, instituted, we, people are trained to follow certain customs, and the result of this is that people will get more of what they wanted, what they want at least in the long term, more than <clears throat> if they uh, just acted as they immediately wanted to do. So in this view, uh, morality is an institution or a device, but in the a Rothbardian view where morality is objective, it isn't, morality isn't invented, it's, uh, it's discovered rather than invented. It, it's, uh, it's not that we just discover that certain rules will be in our interests, it's we're discovering objective truths about the world. Uh, <clears throat> what do we mean when we say, uh, is, we're asking question, is ethics ob objective? What do we mean by this? And this is one of the most important topics in contemporary ethics. Uh, as most philosophers understand this question, when we say, what uh, do, is, do we mean when we say morality is objective? Uh, it's, can, are moral judgments true or false that are in a way that's not dependent on us or our opinions. Uh, to answer no would be to accept subjectivism. Uh, suppose, as, I, as is in fact the case, that I like vanilla ice cream, but you don't. So in a subjectivist view, neither of us is correct or incorrect. It would, we would just have different views on what uh, what we liked. Uh, so a subjectivist would claim morality is like this. We just have different tastes, as it were. Some people like one thing, other people like other things. It can turn out that a lot of people or most people like the same thing, but the preference is just subjective in the sense it's dependent on people's tastes. If we say morality is objective, we would be claiming that uh, moral judgments are true regardless of what people think about them. Uh, just as say, uh, we say we're the, uh, this were now at the von Mises Institute, that's a matter of fact. It's not dependent on your thinking you're at the Mises Institute. You could all be thinking you're somewhere else or wishing that I were somewhere else. <laughs> but this, so here, if you say morality is objective, you're claiming they're matters of fact about uh, morality. I'll just say, as a matter of interest, there, there are some people who just find this notion incomprehensible. Uh, for example, there was a book that came out uh, uh, by just uh, uh, recently. I did a brief review of it. It was by Patricia Churchland, who's a well-known philosopher at uh, University of San Diego, she was commenting on a, a view that uh, Tom Nagel has that morality is objective in the sense I've been explaining. She said she just can't understand how anyone could say this once you give an evolutionary account showing how certain uh, uh, moral reactions developed, how could there possibly be anything more to say about it? She just found this view totally incomprehensible. So there are people who think that way. Of course, she's also what's called an eliminativist. She doesn't think, there. at least at some one point in her career, she didn't think people had any beliefs at all. So. Uh, 
I guess one would one might want to know, does she really believe that this view is incomprehensible? But I'll leave I'll leave that uh, question uh, to to her to answer. <coughs> I'm sure. I'm sure if I asked her, I'm sure she'd ignore my email. She would, she would just dismiss it as hate mail. As, and she would be right. Uh, 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 now, I think it's important to see exactly what the issue is between Mises and Rothbard about objectivity. Uh, Mises certainly thinks that many judgments that have something to do with ethics are true or false. For example, suppose you say the free market enables people to obtain their preferences, or at least certain preferences, those that can be satisfied by, uh, uh, consu by pe uh, producers who are trying to uh, give people what they want one to buy. So Mises would certainly say that's objectively true uh, in the sense that it's just a matter of fact. That's, it's not dependent on people's opinions that the free market work. It's just a law of social science that this is the case. But according to Mises, ultimate value judgments are not true or false. I uh, suppose, for example, somebody doesn't want to be in pain, and this isn't a means to some further end. It isn't that you say, well, I don't want to be in pain because that's preventing me or impeding me from doing some work that I, I have to get out, and I'm concentrating on my headache now, so I can't do the work. So this... <coughs> If you said that, then that might very well be something that's capable of being true or false, that uh, maybe the headache really is ma uh, making you feel, it, preventing you from working. But if you just had felt you don't want the pain anymore, that's it. That, for Mises, would be uh, an ultimate preference, ultimate value judgment. If you said pain is bad, there's that's just mo uh, probably uh, most people would agree with that. There, I suppose there are some who wouldn't, you know, the old, like uh, there are uh, masochists who might reject that, but most people would accept that. So according to Mises, that would just be there's no more you could say about that. That's a preference that people have. That's it. Uh, but Rothbard would disagree with that. Uh, he thinks that their value judgments are objective in the sense that judgments about f facts are true or false. That's not to say that Rothbard doesn't give any place for judgments that are simply preferences. I mean, Rothbard wouldn't say, at least I don't think he would, I never asked him this, that uh, if you like a particular kind of ice cream, there's some objective ma matter of fact about whether your preference is correct. But he would say that there are uh, uh, value judgments that are not means to some further ends that are straightforwardly true or false. So this is the this is the point at issue between them. Uh, now, how can Rothbard show that ethics is objective in the sense that uh, it's appealing? It claims that certain ultimate value judgments are straightforwardly true or false. Uh, Rothbard does this by appealing to natural law, especially by, as developed by St. Thomas Aquinas, the great uh, uh, Catholic theolo uh, philosopher and theologian of the Middle Ages. Uh, 
it remind it, you know, uh, Rothbard in his philosophical views was generally a Thomist, although he wasn't a theist. But uh, it does remind me of uh, one philosopher who said uh, he was he was interested in in Thomas Aquinas, but he was no more than a peeping Thomist. Uh, uh, now, there is a. Pr oh, I, I see some people are just getting the joke now. <laughs> Sometimes these take a while, but we, we have time. Uh, all right, so there is a problem here. Uh, Aquinas was a, uh, as I mentioned, was a Catholic theologian who argued that natural law is part of divine law. Uh, so the question comes up, does accepting natural law commit you to accepting the claims of a particular religion, or if not that, at least philosophical claims about God? In that, uh, So according to Rothbard, uh, and here he has some support in Aquinas himself, considerable support in uh, Aquinas himself, that even though Aquinas thought that natural law was part of God's law, it arriving at the, the truth of natural law depend, depended only on human reason. It didn't require accepting biblical revelation. Of course, it doesn't exclude that, but according to uh, Aquinas and Rothbard followed him, it doesn't require that you except uh, biblical or other revelation. It would be just discoverable by reason. Uh, now, this is disputed. This is, a, if you're interested in uh, Thomistic ethics, this is, this is a big topic in dispute. It's a big topic in dispute, even if you're not interested in Thomistic ethics. It, in fact, is a big topic in dispute. But the uh, it's clear that Aquinas, I think it's quite clear that Aquinas held this view because if you look at his uh, he wrote the uh, in addition to the Summa Theologica he wrote Summa Contra Gentiles which is is an apologetic work for those who don't accept uh, Christianity it's a defense so he starts he says well there are some people who Accept Christianity. Some people who just believe in God, but are not Christian. Some people don't believe in God at all. And he thought there, we can show by reason uh, some things to the people who don't believe in God at all. So Aquinas, even though he was a, th a Catholic theologian, thought there was a we could establish certain things just by reasoning about him. Uh, and there's a famous uh, quotation by the great uh, Dutch legal th theorist Hugo Grotius, who was uh, 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 also a, a theologian, not a Catholic. He was uh, uh, he was what's called an Arminian. He was a Protestant, uh, sort of very sort of a critic of certain kinds of Calvinism, called. Arminian. So he had a famous sentence. He says, what we have been saying would have a degree of validity, even if we could concede, should concede that which cannot be conceded without the utmost wickedness. That there is no God or the affairs of men are of no concern to him. So the claim there would be we can show that natural law is true just by reason. Uh, and Suarez said something about this. Now, there's an interesting, I won't go into details about this, there's an interesting logical problem with the statement by Grotius. If you hold that God exists necessarily, it's a necessary truth that God exists, then uh, on the supposition that he's giving, uh, we would have a necessary truth if God doesn't exist, and there's a necessary truth that's false, 
And if you put that, if you have a necessary falsehood in your system, then you're going to get into a whole lot of logical trouble. So maybe Grotius couldn't, shouldn't have worded his claim this way. He should have just said we could establish uh, the true, certain truths about uh, ethics just by reasoning about it. If uh, you didn't get that, don't worry about it. I, I'm not going to worry about it. But it, it, is a, it is an interesting logical point, though, I think. Uh, now, uh, Rothbard draws a, an interesting parallel between divine command ethics and posit positivism. Uh, uh, for those of you who are in uh, Judge Napolitano's class, you remember legal positivism is the view that law is just the command of the legislator. So something is law just because the legislator says it is law. It doesn't have to meet any requirements of uh, natural law or anything else. It's just this is commanded. So according to divine command ethics, at least in certain versions of divine command ethics, ethics has no basis in reason. Ethical rules are just commands of God. Uh, I should say there are versions, more sophisticated versions of divine command ethics of which this claim isn't right, but uh, I'm not going to go into that right now much as I like to. It's not relevant to this lecture, and I'm dig I digress enough in my lectures as it is. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to overdo it. But uh, here, the legal positive is we could say, well, if God commands something, we could at least say uh, we have good reason to do it because God is an omniscient, an omnipotent, all good being. So if you command something, we have good reason to do it. But here, the legal, the legal positivist would be arrogating to himself the divine prerogatives and acting as if he were able to tell us what to do, as if he were have had divine capacities that just his command could make something right. So Rothbard says, no, no, this isn't true in law. It isn't true in ethics. There's a matter of fact about what's right that can be established by reason. Now, that, how does natural law show that ethical judgments are objective? Uh, Rothbard appeals to essences. Uh, what, is, what do I mean by this? Well, an object properties can be divided into two classes. Uh, one class are the essential properties, characteristics of the object. The object wouldn't be that object unless it had uh, those properties. For example, it's the essence of water to be composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Nothing that isn't consist of hydrogen and oxygen would be water. And the rest of the properties of the object are non-essential. So we have for any object, or at least most objects, they're, they're essential properties. Uh, now, the uh, followers of Ayn Rand carry this view to an extreme, they think that every property of the object is essential. It, uh, that's a, a, a rather strange view, but that they hold that. So for them, if anything about an object were different, it wouldn't be that object. All the properties are essential, but that isn't the standard uh, view in uh, Arist Aristotle or in Thomas Aquinas. So. Uh, what Rothbard, again, in the standard uh, uh, Thomist in Aristotelian way, thinks we can determine the essence of human beings just as we can for other things. But here there is an objection. 
somebody might say, well, suppose Rothbard's right, we could determine what are the essential, what is the essence of a human being in, the, in an analogous way to the way chemists can say the essence of water is to be composed of hydrogen and oxygen mixed in a certain way. Uh, if somebody said that, wouldn't this be part, just be part of anthropology, not ethics? How would an account of the human essence tell us what we should do? It would just be saying, this is what human beings are, but that leaves open the question, what human beings should be. Uh, so, uh, Rothbard answers these questions by appealing to the concept of flourishing or happiness. Uh, if you're to, if you want to flourish, you need to do certain things, and what those things are are di dictated by human nature. Now, so far, as you will, I'm sure, have noticed, this is parallel to Mises. It just says, if you want to flourish, you should do such and such. So this is like Mises' claim, if you want peace and prosperity, you should favor the free market. So the question would come up, well, is there really any difference between Mises and Rothbard? Uh, have I been wasting your time and devoting all this attention to suppose uh, going into all this material about essences? Is this, do they all come down, does, does it just, uh, do they all just come down to the same conclusion with Rothbard just putting in a little different philosophical terminology? But here is the crux of the matter, is that Rothbard doesn't take human flourishing as a mere hypothetical. In the natural law, it's objectively true this is a good that you, this is a good, you should want to flourish if you, for some reason, said, I just don't want to flourish, I don't care about happiness, uh, you would be wrong about it in the same way that somebody would say uh, uh, confused H2O with H2SO4 would be wrong also. That, that would probably, it would be probably <laughs> more easy to show that the second person was wrong fairly quickly. Uh, so Rothbard here rejects what some people call Hume's law, which is that no ought judgment follows from is judgments. If you have just statements of what is the case, uh, you can't deduce what ought to be the case. So Rothbard, <laughs> argues that from the fact that certain things are needed for human beings to flourish, it follows that we ought to want those things. Even if you don't want them, you should. Uh, now, uh, again, but then the question, this seems like a, an odd thing to say, uh, how is it supposed to follow from the fact that we need to do certain things to flourish, that we unconditionally ought to do those things. Most people certainly want to flourish, but what if somebody didn't? Uh, what would be the point of saying to this person, well, you ought to whether you want to or not? Uh, again, suppose you just said, if you want to flourish, you should do that. That would be Mises' position and also Ayn Rand's position, but it isn't standard natural law theory. Uh, again, uh, according to natural law theory, and I, I'm going over this a number of times because it is at first a rather counterintuitive view to many people, especially those people who've been corrupted by too many courses in economics. Uh, it, what you're, in standard natural law theory, what you ought to do isn't dependent on your choosing something. You simply ought to do it. So it's, it's, 
it's not the view that if you, as Ayn Rand says, if you choose to live, you should do such and such where the choice is up to you. In the standard natural law theory, if you said, I don't want to live, that would be wrong. You, you would be doing, you would be choosing something that's objectively wrong. So how do we get these non-hypothetical odds? Uh, now, would be one thing I, I, I just thought of, I could just say, I haven't the slightest idea and then finish the lecture. But I don't think, I don't think that, would be, that would be a good way to do, to do things. It would also be a false claim. So I'm not going to do that. Not that I, I'm above making false claims from time to time. Uh, now, Rothbard notes that living things have certain tendencies. For example, a normal cult will develop into a horse, and a cult that failed to do this would be defective. So we could say a good horse is one that develops normally. And in this view, an animal should develop according to its tendencies. That's just what should means, that it should, uh, uh, an organism should develop normally ought to develop normally. Uh, things ought to fulfill this essence. Their essences, this is just on the this Aristotelian view, what we mean by ought. It's the way really you get an ought from an is, is that you're, the characterization of ought is, is just uh, fulfilling your normal or natural tendency. So you're not making any logical leap. You're just giving the consequences of following that definition. So on this view, if you didn't want to flourish, you would be abnormal. You would be going against your natural tendencies. So you would be not doing, not wanting what you ought to want. Uh, now, uh, there there is a famous objection to arguments of this sort, which is called the open question uh, ob objection. And this was uh, famously given by G. E. Moore. You remember I talked about him in my first lecture on. Uh, Praxeology, where Moore was the one who said there are certain facts that are obvious, that are just, we know these intuitively. This is the same person, G. Moore. He, uh, he was very, he made uh, famous contributions in a lot of different areas. So he said, well, uh, suppose you say ought means, suppose you ask the question, ought we to do what we need to flourish? Uh, should we do what we need to flourish? This question seems to make sense. We can ask, you know, uh, we want to say, what are the reasons that we ought to want this or why maybe we shouldn't want this? seems to make sense and people, in fact, argue about this. But if uh, just means what we need to do to flourish, the question wouldn't make sense. It would be something like saying, ought we to do what we ought to do? It would just be a tautology. So Moore said, just from the fact that we can ask the question and have it make sense, or at least seems to make sense, that shows that uh, ought doesn't uh, mean uh, what we need to do to flourish. But Rothbard could just reply to that, that if we think the question makes sense, we're mistaken. So the argument, uh, the objection here is really assuming what 
the point in controversy. Uh, I I should say there are more there are more technical ways to answer the open question argument, but uh, again, fortunately for you, I'm not going to go into those in this lecture. My lecture is confusing enough as it is. Why why make things worse? They're bad enough already. Uh, now uh, Rothbard says that political philosophy is just a uh, concern with part of ethics. It's confined to delimiting the permissible use of force and threats of force. So ethical issues that don't involve force aren't covered in political philosophy. Uh, it's just, political philosophy is just confined to this one sphere. And this separation between political philosophy and other parts of ethics comes from John Locke, the great uh, British philosopher of the 17th century. And the 19th century German philosopher, Fichte, who is not generally regarded as a libertarian, although he was at a certain, certain stage of his career, he had strong libertarian tendencies, also uh, develop, uh, stress this notion of a separation of political philosophy from the rest of ethics. So political philosophy just concerned with permissible use of force. So one, uh, one point also very important in Rothbard's view of trying to determine what we need to flourish, here he's some, quite a bit in contrast with Henry Hazlitt and Friedrich Hayek, He's suspicious of the role of custom and common law if they're just taken purely by themselves. He says we have to test them by reason, and he doesn't accord them a presumption of truth. Although in certain areas he did. He, he did like the English common law tradition, and he, he did place some emphasis on that. But he said we always have to examine this by reason. Now, uh, Rothbard thinks in order to flourish, each person needs to be a self-owner, meaning each person has the right to decide what to do with his or her own body. I mean, supposing, uh, let's say, uh, somebody, somebody needs a kidney the person needs uh, to have a kidney transplant in order to live. And as it happens, you're a match for this person. So if the person doesn't get the kidney, then he's going to die. But you, after all, can get along with just one kidney. You might have certain problems, but the other, the other person would be needs this in order to live, it's up to you uh, whether you want to donate the kidney to the other person. It isn't, uh, it, you can't be forced to do, to do that. Of course, for me, it wouldn't be a question. I'd just say, absolutely not. <laughs> that would be foolish. I, uh, I would agree with more with the character in the Woodhouse novel I quoted at the start of the lecture. But that, like many things in this lecture, is beside the point. Uh, so it's up, it, it isn't, I should say, it isn't, the notion of self-ownership isn't a philosophically problematic concept, contrary to what some people think. Again, all it means is that each person should be in control of certain decisions about his own body, such as the kidney example or blood transfusion example I just mentioned. Now, I should say also, uh, self-ownership does not imply, as some people wrongly think, that the mind is separate from the body and owns it. You're not making 
when you talk about self-ownership, you're not making any assumptions about the mind-body relation. So it, it self and self-ownership is what we, what we call reflexive. Uh, suppose you say, for example, somebody uh, lacks self-esteem. We don't mean that the person's self lacks esteem for something else, namely the person's body. We just mean he doesn't regard himself very highly. So in the same way, a self-owner controls certain aspects of himself. It isn't that we're taking the self as something separate. Uh, now, uh, some people object to this and they say, well, that isn't real ownership because real ownership must involve a separation between the owner and what's owned. I must say I find this an odd objection because even though I've argued before that, or, uh, in the Aristotelian view there are essences, ownership isn't a thing in the world. It's just a term invented for our convenience. It doesn't have an essence. We can define it as we please. So if you don't like the term self-ownership, uh, feel free to use some other term. Nothing turns on what word we use, but some people really will make a big fuss about this. Oh, you know, you can't talk about self-ownership. This is illegitimate, but they're wrong about that. Take it from me. Uh, if you say that, if you give this view on the oral exam, the one I objected to, you won't do well, I guarantee it. Uh, so I'll just say uh, we're running out of time, but uh, how does Rothbard make the claim for self-ownership? He does it in certain in certain way by contrasting uh, self-ownership with other systems, like we could have, suppose uh, we have, imagine a system where some people own others where there's slavery where there's slavery so rothbard says well isn't it obvious slavery is wrong so here he's at least at this point he's somewhat of a moral intuitionist someone who thinks we can grasp the truth about some moral claims uh, for example suppose we say it would be it's wrong to kill babies for fun and somebody said, well, how do we know that? Why is that true? I think we would say that person is missing the point. It isn't true owing to certain dependent. His truth isn't dependent on accepting a particular theory or certain reasons. It just is true. Uh, so uh, after he establishes self-ownership, Rothbard then develops an account of how people acquire property. So he says land and other resources start out unowned, and people own their own labor. And when they mix their labor with the unowned land in an appropriate way, they acquire the land, and property rights leave no room for a legitimate state. Uh, now, on the last point, I'll, I see we're out of out of running out of time. So I'll, I'll just conclude with an uh, interesting point that's often missed that how Mises differs with Rothbard on property right. Mises thinks we need a legal system where people have stable property rights because this is essential to how the free, have the free market works. But it doesn't follow that for Mises, these rights have to be acquired through homesteading. Any stable system of property rights will do. So Mises, in fact, in fact, is an opponent of traditional natural law theory, and he rejects uh, labor these uh, kind of Lockean appropriation views. This just isn't his way of doing things. You could certainly accept what Mises says about the benefits of the free market and still accept this uh, 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 Lockean view of ownership, but that isn't the way 
Mises does it. I remember there was someone who uh, used to work at the Mises Institute who was trying to insist, no, no, Mises does accept these uh, the same uh, uh, views on uh, of property as Rothbard does, <coughs> because those would be the ones supported by utilitarian theory. But that view isn't right. I don't think it's a coincidence that person isn't with the Mises Institute anymore. Uh, but I don't claim responsibility for that. So, all right, well, we're out of time now, so thank you very much. Thank you.